hearts were broken. And the natural inclination of a person when they're, su when they're suffering is to be sad. And it's a human reaction and it's okay, it's permitted, it's even therapeutic and encouraged. But there's a certain time when a person has to get a hold of themselves and say, it's a luxury to be sad. And I have to consider now how I can be helpful and how I can be productive. So that Mendel, as he's affectionately known, said to his Talmudian the following story. It was during the very dark days of Russian persecution, and there was a child who was homeless and didn't have anyone to look after him. So he connected himself to a street musician. And the street musician had an accordion, and he would play wonderful music, and the child would dance around and say, Freilecher, Freilecher, livelier, livelier, and everybody would be impressed by the performance, and they'd give a, a groschen, a little coin, or whatever it might be, and that's how they were sustaining themselves. But he ayoing that the street musician set himself up in a corner, and he starts playing the accordion, and the child, the way children are, was daydreaming. So he's trying to get his attention, he plays a little louder, he looks at him, give a stern look, sometimes people turn around. The child was somewhere else. So suddenly, out of a sense of desperation to get the child's attention, the street musician reaches across and gives the child a slap across the face. Immediately the kid is awake. And he realizes now it's performance time. So he begins to dance and livelier, livelier, and at the same time, pain of Zolgu the Moise. His, his eyes are screaming with tears. As he got a slap. This is the story that the Chsibun would share. The previous have actually had shared them. But they didn't understand the meaning of the story. They weren't sure what is the perspective that this story tries to teach. So they discussed it amongst themselves. And first they said that really, truly, the child is crying because he got a slap. And then after a little longer, they thought further and they realized that that's not really the case. Really, truly, the true disposition of this boy is when he's dancing freilecher, freilecher. That's really who he, who he truly is. You hear, Michael? Right here. And the fact that he's crying is a temporary aberration from who he truly is. So the metal said to his Talmudian, he said that Timotam was happy. And for us, it's like we got a flask, like we got a slap across the face. But we're not going to say to ourselves, not because we got a slap across the face, we're broken and we're truly crying. But if in case it doesn't happen that we have a moment when we feel some sadness, truly who are we? We're strength. We're joy. We're of opportunity. We're seeking to be of service. And if there's a moment of weakness, we strengthen each other to help overcome it. But never do we say that our true way of being is to be chaliva sad. So I'm going to share with you a thought about how is it sensible to not be sad. Because we were sitting here earlier, and you did know you saw Menachem, also known as Michael I. Bernstein Law Firm. No, guys. 30, 30, 10 biscuits. Cool. 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 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, for whatever reason it might be that he had opportunity, but he didn't go see the Rebbe. And one could say they feel badly they got to see the Rebbe too, because who says ever that one could say they took a full, full opportunity of what it, meant, what it meant to be in the same room and to be able to interact with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So the Vart is Azeh. This is the Vart. The Vart is that the Rebbe himself addressed this issue. And... He addressed this issue in regards to his father-in-law, his predecessor, whom he was always seeking means of having a greater and greater connection. There was no greater chassid of the previous Rebbe than the Rebbe. And in 1966, in Tavshin Chavav, the Rebbe said this word. He said that the Gemara says, Yaakov Avinu loy meis. Yaakov Avinu did not die. The Gemara asks a question, but didn't they do the process of a person's burial? They did all that they did over there for him to be buried. How do you say he didn't die? So the Gemara answers, Ma'zari b'chayim, ahu b'chayim. As his children are alive, is he alive? So the answer, says the Rebbe, is that this answer doesn't answer the question. 
What was the question? How could you say Yaakov Avinu died? There was no retraction. All that happened was, we said, there's, the children are alive. The Rebbe explained as follows. How do you define life? For some people, most of us, life is how we feel. We live with our goof, with our body. I like to eat, I enjoy the food tonight. Fantastic Chinese food with MSG like I never had before. <laughs> God bless you. I enjoy the and Grey Goose of all the vodka. They're all nasty. This one happens to be the least of the nasty vodka. <laughs> the other guys here are having a good time with everything else. And who's enjoying it? Our goof is enjoying it. And our neshama, our soul, seeks to have a moment maybe whereby it can assert itself and we'll have some feeling of truth and sincerity. And then the goof is going to take control again. Then there are those who don't live with goof, even though they have a goof. They live with soul. And then their goof is fully compliant with their soul, but in truth, their life is not defined at all by their goof. For instance, some people want to eat, so in order to eat, they make a bracha. Other people that are very holy Jews want to make a bracha. In order to make a bracha, they eat. A Rebbe, a tzaddik, is all soul. The fact that the Rebbe's goof was alive from Yid Aleph Nisan, 1902, until Gimel Tam was 1994, wasn't the indicator of the Rebbe's life. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when the Gemara says, by Yaakov Avinu, they did not die, what does it mean? It means, very exactly, Ma Zaroy Bachayim, just as his children are alive, as they are, like me, I'm physically alive, Afu, is he alive in his way, which is soul. So if we say, oh, the Rebbe's leadership in some way became diminished, on Gimel Tamil 1994. Or if we say that in some way the opportunity is less, what we're saying then is that the Rebbe's li living is all physical body. And that isn't true. The Rebbe's living was always so and will always be so. So therefore, soul is always alive. And indeed, what's very important to note, which is what we spoke about a moment here earlier, that the Rebbe's soul is interested in this generation that's alive now. There was a lot of very holy, holy Jews over the course of our history who were very, very great leaders. You have Dovin Amalach, Abay and Rabba, the Rambam, the Rosh, the Rif, the Ram. Who knows all the various great sages. But the Rebbe made it so whereby it's clear his interest is this generation. So therefore, if that's his interest, Shom Menachem, you're disturbing me, I can't think. My cup isn't able to listen to you and to what I want to say. It's really good. <laughs> So the word is, the word is, I'll share this with you. Many of you have heard, since it's a public thing, there was a very great publisher, a Jewish publisher, named Rabbi Zlatowicz. And his father was Rabbi Aaron Zlatowicz. And Aaron Zlatowicz was born in 18, I believe he was born in 18... Could it be 1899 or 1889? I think it was 1889. And he had written a sefer called Nachas Arim. And when he was 99 years old, during the month of Elul, he came to the Rebbe for a dollar. And when he came to the Rebbe for a dollar, he said to the Rebbe, he was 10 years older than the Rebbe, 11, 12 years older than the Rebbe. He was 99 years old. He says to the Rebbe, I'm here. I'll ask the Rebbe a question, the Rebbe will answer. Because in his mind, it's like he's speaking to, you know, you're going to do what I tell you. The Rebbe, always compliant, try to be of service. He says to the Rebbe, the Rebbe knows me, right? We've spoken learning in the past. The Rebbe says, sure, we know each other. He says, you know, I wrote a sefer, Nachmas I sent it to the Rebbe, and I never got a bracha. So the Rebbe says to him, I went to my father-in-law at the oil, and you have his bracha. He says to the Rebbe, that's not what I mean. I want the Rebbe's bracha. So the Rebbe says, well, then you have my bracha too. You have a bracha kfula. You have a double blessing. A blessing for my shver and a blessing for me. He says to the Rebbe, that's not what I mean. I want it in writing. Does the Rebbe have my address? 1291 East 9th Street. <laughs> At that point, Rabbi Groner steps in. He goes, we have your address. <laughs> Then he's consoled. He says to the Rebbe, what's about the Rebbe, I'll say, you know, now that I've got my, uh, off my chest, how is the Rebbe? So the Rebbe said, you see, I'm here, I'm giving tzedakah, I'm giving brachas, I hope Hashem helps that the blessings should be fulfilled. 
And then they continued their conversation, and the Rebbe blessed him, and he left. This was Elul. Within three months, he was in the next world, this Rabbi Zlat was. So one could wonder, did he do better because he insisted on the Rebbe to give him a bracha? Did he do better because he insisted on the Rebbe giving a bracha in writing? Or the bracha of the Rebbe is the bracha of the Rebbe, whether or not the Rebbe sort of has to focus. Does he have to focus and zap the guy in order to be able to give the bracha? Of course not. Now for him, that was important because that's where he was coming from and that's why the Rebbe helped him have that. But it doesn't mean that that's the only way. To the contrary, if a person starts to think that that's what has to happen, they're going to be able to get a bracha, then they turn a Rebbe into an ATM. And the Rebbe is not an ATM. A Rebbe is a help, is an opportunity, a relationship to be able to connect to the to the Eibushnei. Then, since the role of a Rebbe is to be responsible for the chassid, responsibility includes material needs. So that's why the chassid goes to the Rebbe for material needs too. But not to say that if you don't get the Rebbe to pay attention, it doesn't work. And now I'll share with you a Gimel Tamas Maisa. And then we'll have more of whatever my people see later. Some years ago, I went to I went to Lakewood, New Jersey. There was a guy here in town. There was a guy here in town. His name was Speed Penance Shapsi Pfeffer. Harrison Pfeffer. Harrison. Harrison. Huh? Yeah. Harrison Pfeffer. His father passed away a couple years ago. He was here in Miami. Tired and tired of kid, and he got married. So I went to his wedding in Lakewood. I was the only Garfield in the room, which is cool. Steve Pepper? The lawyer, the big lawyer. Yeah. His father is Steve Pepper. Right? The big lawyer, big lawyer. So I went to the wedding because I'm, I have a rule, which is a good rule. I encourage all of you to adopt the rule, which is that if you're invited to a simcha, go. Even if it means you have to travel, because then the Abishta says, give a cook. He's going to simchas. I'll keep him going to simchas. <laughs> If you're only going to go Khalil to not Simchas, right. then uh, that's not such a good indicator of where your priorities lie. Thank God. But if you so only go to Simchas, Hashem says, good, this guy's for Simchas. So I went to the Simcha in Lakewood. Right here. Yeah. I went to Lakewood, and my telephone was dying. I needed to have it for the GPS on the way back, and I don't have Bluetooth in my car. You know, my so I decided I needed to get this puppy charged up. So I took the, the cell phone charger and I went into the hall and my seat was in the middle tables and there was nobody, there was no chargers nearby, no outlets nearby, but there was an outlet near another table. So my father taught me a trick in 770. If you have to take your talus off and use the bathroom, it's quite likely that when you come back, someone else will have borrowed it. So what do you do? You go over to someone else who's standing nearby, you hand him your talus, and you say, Shay Marchino. What's he gonna do now? <laughs> he takes the talus, he's done. Let's say the Shemachino. <laughs> so I figure I'll do the same thing. I go over to the table where the fellow was sitting. There's an outlet. I plug in my phone. I say, Shay Mechino. That's a joke, but that's a little sincerity too. The guy says, Okay, Shay Mechino, would you like me to tell you a story of the that? I said, Bechavo, tell me. He tells me, as a, he says, that he was a baby, a boy rather. His father had passed away, and his mother got remarried. And they were living in Brooklyn, and his mother got married to a, to a man from out of state, from the West Coast. So she said, you stay living in Brooklyn by the grandmother, and I will go back to where my husband is on the West Coast. And she would come visit him very often. And he was then living with his grandmother, and his mother was there in, the, in New York, and it was Thursday evening, and they had an appointment to see the Rebbe. And the Rebbe blessed them. And then Friday morning she flew back to her where she was living. And it happens to be that this guy, when he was a child, had a degenerative eye disease that was a mystery to the doctors. It was a very rare thing. And they didn't know how to cure him. Shabbos morning he woke up and he had terrible pain in his eyes. So his grandmother contacted the mother, who got on the flight that she could right after Shabbos. She was back in New York Sunday morning. And you know there's no more powerful force in the world than a mother's love. So she got the doctors out of their beds to come to their office on Sunday to examine her son. And they took a scan, and they compared it with the old scan, and they said, something's changing here. We recommend taking it to the hospital, we'll sedate him, so we can figure out what's happening. So she said, I think that what's happening here is that a miracle is occurring. So I'm not sedating him, I'm not keeping him here, I'm leaving, goodbye. She took it. 
It took a couple of days, and his eyes became healed. Very good. Goes by many years. He's a full-grown adult. He had other interactions with another, with another had been helpful to him. And now it's Gibel Tamil, it's 1994, Tavshin and Dava. His mother calls him. She says to him, you're living in Lakewood, but are you going to the Rebbe's Levaya today? So he says to her, no, I'm not. So she says, how could you not go to the Rebbe's Levaya? The Rebbe is the one who gave you sight and so many other good things. How could you not go? So he says, okay, I'm going to go. So he, got, he went to the mikveh, because he has seichel. And his car, his car, because you don't go to such a place without going to the mikveh. His car was a big, huge, blue or black suburban. And he was a member of Atella, which means it was decked out, like, you know, lights and sirens and all the shriyot that you guys like to have. They're not shriyot, you show. Because I have a car with lights and sirens, it's pretty fun. But, anyway, he gets on the car of the state, and he's coding all the way to Brooklyn. He gets to Crown Heights, comes to Eastern Parkway, and people have that achedas for a car that looks official. So this guy's in this official looking car with lights and sirens. Everyone splits, and they let him through. He ends up on Eastern Parkway, on the service road, right behind, the, the Rebbe was in a blue suburban, I believe, as well. That was the, used as a hearse. And then he was a car or two behind. And somebody opens the door and says, we're from the coil of the light. We have to get to the oil first, or behind the Rebbe to be able to help you. The Levaya, can you give us a ride? He says, everybody get in. And they got into his car. And he got right in there right into the oil, and he was right there. Now, who was able to be there? Not many. I mean, I personally wasn't. It took me some time till I got there, and I had to wait, and there was a crowd. We jumped the fence, we did. Yeah? Well, I, was the I was with my father, we went, we did whatever we did. Anyway, the good thing is that this guy was right in there. He tells me the story next. The deal, I still have, I still have uh, 75 minutes left. Sure was it. He says, this is the story. So I told him the following. I told him with a lot of niceness. I said, you know, the Gemara says about the Birchim and Zakai, he was constantly dedicated to, to being of service to the Jewish people. The Birchim and Zakai. He put his life in danger. He went to visit the Roman Emperor. He could have been killed. But it didn't matter because he knew that his purpose is to be of service. When was he self-centered? On the day of his passing. And he said, Amy, a day of the I don't know which way they'll take me while I go to heaven or hell. Which, by the way, parenthetically, since we're speaking about the Mendel Fukutas, he said once that this question of the Ezedet of Malikim was no longer relevant. Because if you go to heaven and you're far from your Rebbe, who needs heaven? And if you go to hell and you're near your Rebbe, it ain't so bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just a life I But anyway, the coolest thing is we shall remain alive in this world. Yeah. The point is like this. Let me just finish the Mishuda. The point is the following. The, the Rebbe on Gimel Tamus, when the Rebbe should be focused only on what's necessary for him and his soul to be able to focus and, 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 and whatever will, be, will happen, nothing happens by chance. No one is near just because. There's no Mikra Ikra. Everything happens purposefully. Indicates to us that the Rebbe never stopped being of service. That even on the day of his own funeral, this guy from Lakewood, who didn't even value the opportunity and didn't even recognize the bracha that he had had, and indeed, when the Rebbe did give him the bracha for the sight, he didn't have to zap him. Indicates to us, number one, that the Rebbe's interest is in every one of us, whether or not we did or didn't participate during his lifetime, after his lifetime. We're thinking this way, we're not thinking this way. You dab in this new stuff, you don't dab in this new stuff. You wear a garter, you don't wear a garter. You got a beard, you don't got a beard. You wear a hat, you don't wear a hat. You wear a film, you don't wear a film. You wear a shape, you don't wear a shape. You wear pants, you wear skirts, whatever you do. Because the hey, the coolest thing it is. The Rebbe's interest is in every single individual in a deep, personal way, and he doesn't have to make it so whereby you say, ah, I got that nice little path, a nice little let. Instead, how much effort you invest is how you'll feel. And then that's truth, because you don't feel something that's false, because you have a truth barometer in you. And the fact that the Rebbe is the Rebbe, and not a generation's past Rebbe, is the reason why this is relevant, because it's about the people that we are today, and as I've said here to our little Yedidim here, Elam Haz is not so bad, so we're going to stick around. And surely the brachas that we're seeking will be fulfilled in their most physical, material, experiential sense. And indeed, will provide the spiritual benefit that Hashem seeks and the relationship that He seeks. 
and together we'll rejoice for the coming of Mashiach now. Amen. Amen. Amen.